Dr. Natalie Marks, and we're here with a quick cup of knowledge. Joining me today is Dr. Dawn Booth. She is double boarded in internal medicine and pharmacology and an alumni professor and director of clinical pharmacology at Auburn University. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I, I'm so excited about this interview because I think today you are lecturing on the hottest topic in veterinary medicine right now, the cannabinoids. So there's a lot of people listening that have heard things and probably a lot of myths and um, maybe some information floating yep. around you're nodding yep. here. Let's just start at the basics. Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of um, information do we need for a solid foundation on what cannabinoids really are in our world? So I think the first thing is we need to remember that when we're talking about medical cannabinoids, that can be marijuana or it can be any product that's made from a cannabinoid constituent of marijuana. Of course, what makes marijuana marijuana are the cannabinoids. Um, recently, the United States Congress approved uh, industrial hemp, that, hemp. They actually approved it in 2014, but in 2018 they did. And that is actually different, and I think it's fair to talk now about two different products, marijuana and now industrial hemp, which has been legally defined to contain not less than point, either 0.3% or less of THC on a dry matter weight basis. And that's important because it's THC that brings to the table the psychoactive component and it's probably going to be the more likely abuser. So in my mind, I think one of the first things that we need to understand is what the products that most veterinarian, most clients are purchasing are presumably ultimately going to be products from industrial hemp and not products that are marijuana based. Is that oh, making sense? It absolutely does. Um, and, and just as an aside, I'm going to remind the practitioners that just because marijuana has been legalized for recreational or medicinal use in the United States does not mean that's true for veterinary patients as well. So that is going to be an ongoing resolution. Absolutely. And, and so with this class, um, there and we were just talking, there really hasn't been a clear, concise, and defined yeah. um, goal or research finding yet mm -hmm. because it's so new. But what kind of studies are being done right now? So uh, there has been one study already done, I'm assuming you're seeing in animals, and people yes. there are a plethora of studies. The NIH actually sponsors studies, so lots of stuff going on in people, and some of that actually will be extrapolatable to animals. But in veterinary medicine, there are limited studies, and part of the reason for that is because up to today, the DEA has, has said that CBD, which is one of the more popular cannabinoids, is a class one substance, mm. a schedule one substance, and they still say that. But that's where the definition of industrial hemp now gives us an out because it no longer will be a class one substance since it doesn't contain uh, THC, and it's not CBD, it's hemp oil that's been extracted from industrial hemp. So in Cornell, there was a study that was done that demonstrated efficacy of CBD-based product uh, in treatment of osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. uh, at Colorado State, I think that there is a uh, clinical trial looking at epilepsy. We're implementing a quality of life survey in dogs and cats, and we're implementing a couple of kinetic studies as well. But as far as clinical trials, there aren't that many. And there are gonna be some issues with the clinical trials. There's barriers, a lot of things that have to happen before we can have some good credible information about the clinical trials. Gotcha. And most, most notably is making sure that the product that's being used is gonna be the product, the product that's being used for that study is gonna be the product that's being used in your patient because there is going to be a lot of variability in these products. It sounds like it. And that brings up a point that I'm sure a lot of our listeners are going to have and probably some that we already have experienced. I know I have. A client comes in with a patient and they bring in a bottle, <laughs> right, from a health food right. store and they say, hey, I found this CBD. Can I give it to my dog who's limping? What's your response to that? So first of all, let me answer from an industrial hemp standpoint. Although that's been legalized, none of the products on the market are legal yet because for them to be sold legally, they have to go through a process where the USDA has verified the source to be industrial mm -hmm. hemp and the states have come up with protocols for selling. So all the products on the market right now are not legal. They will be legal. So I think once that bill has been implemented to the point that the states now have these protocols, there's going to be some level of regulation and confidence on the part of the client. But currently, 
if you're talking to a client, I think the things that they have to understand is, yes, you can probably give it to your patient. There is no um, guarantee or no confidence about the amount of CBD that's in these products and CBD being the active cannabinoid that most people are using right now. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you that probably the dose is too low because mm. most of those products contain, and I'm gonna use this as an example, gummy bear, contains five milligrams per gummy bear. If you look at the CBD product that's just been approved for use in the United States as a drug, mm -hmm. Epidolex, the starting dose for treating refractory epilepsy in kids is two mg per kg. And you go up to two, 25 mg per kg twice a day. So when you're talking about a five milligram gummy bear, that might be good for a Yorkie, but it's gonna be a much different thing for a Labrador. Definitely. Now what about cats? Is there any talk yeah. about cats? So there, there are cats that are on CBD, and the reason that we know this is because we get samples of um, patients that are um, monitored for anti-epileptics, and there's quite a few of them that are receiving CBD, both cats and dogs. So to my knowledge, there aren't any other studies other than the ones that we're implementing at Auburn, and we're looking at some molecular studies, but we're also looking at kinetic studies as well. But that needs to be a species that's not left behind because there are a lot of therapeutic indications for cats as well as dogs. We talked a lot here about pain mm -hmm. and also the mm -hmm. seizure diseases, mm -hmm. but it certainly sounds like if there's some extrapolation coming from human medicine that we might also be able to use these for behavioral diseases like anxiety. Anxiety, um, cancer is gonna be a wonderful indication not just for controlling clinical signs associated with chemotherapy like anorexia and vomiting, but actually anti-cancer effects as well. And so the idea of using them as combination pain modality for cancer is pretty uh, exciting, let's just say exciting, not just appealing, but exciting. Incredibly exciting. Yeah. She also spoke about quality of life, and can you talk a little bit more about that survey? So this is a survey that we're implementing. We're using a validated quality of life survey that was developed out of Glasgow, and that's been documented that even in the absence of placebo, this method can be used to assess the impact of therapeutic interventions on the quality of life for dogs suffering from chronic diseases. So what we're going to implement is a study in dogs dogs uh, that are, are getting dogs, the clients are of course going to have the survey, but they're going to be clients of dogs that are getting ready to start a cannabinoid based product and we're going to be looking at anxiety, epilepsy, non-cancer pain, mm -hmm. and then osteoarthritis. And the idea will be looking at the impact of the cannabinoid that they've chosen on the quality of life. We'll get a baseline before they start and then we'll follow them for up to four months uh, for everything except epilepsy and that will be six months. Wow. And we're going to actually do cats as well, at least that's my plan. I'm pretty excited about that as well. So it's a start. It's a survey, but it's a validated survey, and it will give us an idea. Uh, part of what we're going to do is ask our clients to get their pet's cannabinoids measured in their bloodstream so we mm -hmm. can actually start relating that back to drug concentrations as well, because a common question is, how much does it take? Right. And I can imagine you're probably not going to have a hard time finding people for that survey because this is such yeah. a topic that's driving both it is. You know, both the right. human and the veterinary world mm -hmm. about what this could add to quality of life across the board. That's right. So That's right. really exciting. I, I am going to caution, you know, I'm always cautioning because this is such an integrated physiologic system in the body. I mean, it's involved with just about everything. And so I'm a little bit nervous about using products to manipulate that. That's probably, probably one of the reasons why a CBD is more appealing to me than let's say marijuana because you know it's crisp, it's pure, I don't have to worry about all these other things going mm. on and so um, I, I, again, I'm always, I tend to be a little bit cautious when something new is coming out because if it has all these therapeutic indications it also means that you're doing things to the body and I just want us to be aware of that. Sure. And can patients right now overdose on the CBD? Do we even know if that's something? Because I'm sure there are going to be people listening that say, mm -hmm. you know, I've had a, a patient come in and the owner says, well, they got into my CBD product or my mm -hmm. hemp product and the whole thing's gone. Are we going to see similar signs to a... Yeah, and I, I, so first of all, I'm going to tell you, I don't think even marijuana is very toxic to animals. Mm -hmm. I think some of the clinical signs we see where the animal sleeps a lot, it's not really a toxicity, it's a side effect. CBD is going to be even better, if I can use that yeah. term. It's going to be very hard, I think, for an animal to get in trouble with CBD. First of all, if they take it orally, most of it's going to be removed from the system anyway. Um, but at least studies, early studies, when they were using dogs as models for people, they'd give CBD intravenously 
with very few side effects. So mm. I think it's going to be very difficult to get an animal in trouble. Having said that, remember we don't know what is in these dietary supplements and mm -hmm. so just because they say there's CBD and nothing else does not necessarily mean that's true. So we'll always want to be a little bit careful. Right. Well, I mean this wisdom is so invaluable because again this is such a hot topic mm -hmm. and I think we I can speak for the profession we're all so excited to see what's on the horizon yeah see I the, am too. the results I of really your survey yep. and it yep. sounds like there's a lot of indications out there that um, yeah. this class of drug might help in improving quality of life across the board right. I agree so yeah. thanks for your work thanks for joining us thank ha you so much for the invitation and I have appreciate a, it. a great rest of your conference wonderful thank you so much thank you